morning scripture reading before the lesson comes from 1 Peter 2, 11 through 17. I'll be reading from the King James Version. 1 Peter 2, 11 through 17. Dearly beloved, I beseech you as strangers and pilgrims against abstain from fleshly lusts which war against the soul, having your conversation honest amongst the Gentiles, that whereas they speak against you as evildoers, they may by your good works, which they shall behold, glorify God in their day of visitation. Submit yourself to every ordinance of man for the Lord's sake, whether it be to the king, the supreme, or unto governors, as unto them that are sent by him for the punishment of evildoers, and for the praise of them that do well. For so is the will of God, that with well-doing ye may put silence ignorance of foolish men as free and not using your liberty for a cloak of maliciousness, but as servants of God. Honor all men, love the brotherhood, fear God, honor the king. We truly considered what Jesus meant in Matthew 5, 16. Let your light so shine before men that they may see your good works and glorify your Father which is in heaven. Well, there may be a lot that could be said about that, but surely we understand it means we're to influence the whole world for good. Wouldn't you say? A lot could be said, but I think that's a pretty simple way to boil it down. Now, obedience to the gospel of Christ involves more than just hearing, believing, repenting, confessing Christ as the Son of God, and being immersed in water for the remission of sins. Do you pay attention at the conclusion of the sermon? Because the last thing perhaps could be argued, though it wouldn't really matter, but is one of the most important aspects and that involves being faithful. Is that not what the preacher generally says? Or walk in the light as the Godhead is in the light? What does it mean to be faithful? What does it mean to walk in the light? Have you paused and reflected on that? Because it sort of has something to do with Matthew 5, 16, if you begin to think about it deep enough. Well, surely it means that in order to be a faithful member of the church of Christ, we must obey every aspect of the New Testament correctly. That means we need to teach the truth. We mean, it means that we need to live the truth. Whatever the New Testament teaches to be correct, we need to do that. Simply put, that's what it means to be faithful or to walk in the light. Well, let me give you some things to consider. Does that mean that we have to obey Titus 3, 1, and 2 in order to be faithful? Put them in mind to be subject to principalities and powers, to obey magistrates, to be ready to every good work, to speak evil of no man, to be no brawlers but gentle, showing all kindness, all gentleness, as it were, to all men. Do we have to obey that in order to be faithful? Is that hard to understand? I mean, stay with me. Is that hard to understand? Because I'm going to give you another one. What about Romans 13, 1 through 7? Is that part of the New Testament? Do we have to obey that in order to be faithful? Let every soul be subject unto the higher powers, for there is no power but of God. The powers that be are ordained of God. Whosoever therefore resisteth the power resisteth the ordinance of God. And they that resist shall receive to themselves damnation. For rulers are not a terror to good works, but to the evil. Wilt thou then not be afraid of the power? Do that which is good, and thou shalt have praise of the same. For he is the minister of God to thee for good. But if thou do that which is evil, be afraid. For he beareth not the sword in vain. For he is the minister of God, a revenger to execute wrath upon him that doeth evil. Wherefore ye must needs be subject. Not only for wrath, but also for conscience' sake. For, for this cause pay ye tribute also. For they are 
God's ministers attending continually upon this very thing? Render therefore to all their dues, tribute to whom tribute is due, custom to whom custom, fear to whom fear, honor to whom honor. You mean to tell me that that's part of the New Testament, right? Is that New Testament? That's New Testament. Now you tell me that in order to be faithful, I need to obey every aspect of the New Testament, except Romans 13, 1, 7. Except Titus 3, 1 and 2. Except 1 Peter 2, 11 through 17. You better wake up, friend. Do we shine the light of the gospel when we disobey anything the Lord commands? That's something we need to think about today. We're going to talk about our obligations to civil government. We're going to be in 1 Peter 2. We're going to do it similarly to what we did Romans 13 last week. Three things we're going to do today. Number one, we're obligated to submit to civil government. Is that not clearly in the text? Number two, we're obligated to support civil government. If not, what does this text teach when it says honor the king? What does that mean? And then number three, we're going to give us some solutions to some important questions. Let me tell you what the rule is. The rule regarding civil government is to obey. That's the rule. Let me give you something to parallel that with, as it were. The rule regarding marriage is one eligible man and one eligible woman for life. That's the rule. The exception to civil government is if it tries to make wrong right or to make right wrong. But what's the rule? The rule is we obey. What's the exception regarding marriage? Jesus said it in Matthew 19, 9, except it be for fornication. But what's the rule? The rule is one man, one wife for life. That's the rule. What's the rule regarding civil government? Submit yourselves to every ordinance of man for the Lord's sake. That's the rule. What's the exception? If civil government tries to make wrong right, nope. If civil government tries to make right wrong, nope. But what's the rule? Don't look at everything from the eyes of the exception. Look at it from the eyes of the rule. What is the rule? Now, let's look at the text. 1 Peter 2, we're going to I guess abstain, as it were, from verses 11 and 12. But we're going to pick up in verse 13. The first thing we're talking about, we're obligated to submit to civil government. Now, let's simply consider the actual words of the New Testament from a reliable version. Is that still okay to do? Is it still okay to consider the words of the Bible from a reliable version? Okay. 1 Peter 2 and verse 13. Look at the requirement. Submit yourselves. Now, is that not similar to the first part of Romans 13, 1? Let every soul be subject unto the higher powers. This qualifies it. Yes, we are to be subject unto the higher powers, but we're to submit ourselves. We're to willingly put ourselves under the authority of civil government. If not, what does it teach? And do, do those first two words sound like a suggestion? Does it sound like it's an optional matter? What's the rule? The rule says submit yourselves. Now, look at the regulations. Submit yourselves to every ordinance of man. Now, though it is a man's ordinance, well, what do you mean? That which is created, founded, or established by civil government, true or false, God expects his children to obey. Submit yourselves to every ordinance of man. What does that mean? What if it said, submit yourselves to every command of God? Would there be any debate about that? Do you not realize that this is a command of God? Submit yourselves to every ordinance of man. That is the requirement. But look at the reason. Submit yourselves to every ordinance of man. What? For the Lord's sake? When you see the word for in your mind, say reason. Why? Submit yourselves to every ordinance of man. Why? What does the text say? For the Lord's sake, obedience to civil law proves that Christians are not rabble-rousers. Are we rabble-rousers? 
Are we trying to revolt against everything? Generally, and understand this, generally speaking, civil disobedience is an eyesore for the Lord's church. Now, I understand that there is an exception. I understand that. But what is the rule? The rule is to submit yourselves to every ordinance of man. Why? For the Lord's sake. Now, look at the rulers that we're to submit to. Whether it be to the king. Now, understand this. Lest anyone think that civil government was peachy keen in Peter's day, this book can be accurately dated in the mid-60s. That would probably be around A.D. 64. Do you know who the king was when Peter was inspired by the Holy Spirit to write this? Nero Caesar. If ever there lived a pervert, if ever there lived somebody that was ungodly, it was Nero Caesar. And in fact, when you begin to look through the Caesars of Rome, none of them were really the salt of the earth. Not one of them. But when Peter was inspired to write this, what did the Holy Spirit move him to record? Submit yourselves to every ordinance of man for the Lord's sake, whether it be to the king. That's Nero Caesar from Peter's perspective when he penned. A pervert, a murderous pervert would probably be an accurate and blunt way to describe Nero. You mean to tell me that God's children had to submit to what that man said? Yes, except. If he tried to make wrong right or if he tried to make right wrong. Do you understand that? Whether it be to the king as supreme or unto governors. As unto them that are sent by him, that is sent by the king. For, why, did, why would he send them? For the punishment of evildoers and for the praise of them that do well. Now how do you miss that? If we read nothing else, what kind of citizens ought we to be as members of the Lord's church? Why, they, the civil government shouldn't have any problem with us at all, should they? Now, if civil government tries to make wrong, right, or right, wrong, we don't have to go into that. But what is the rule? We submit. Now, look at 1 Peter 2, 15 and 16. Is it still all right to just simply consider the words of the New Testament from a reliable version? I have the King James Version. Is that still considered by many to be a reliable version? I hope so. Verse 15. What? There's that word for again. This gives us another reason. We need to recognize this. For so is the will of God. Now think with me, friend. You mean to tell me that civil government comprised of human beings can create a law and it is the will of God that his children obey that law? If that's not what that teaches, what does it teach? What does it teach? For so is the will of God. God's will for mankind is to be civil and obedient. Is it not? Now, look at the righteousness. For so is the will of God that with well-doing ye may put to silence the ignorance of foolish men. Do you not see that well-doing involves submitting to the authority of civil government? In what capacity? Civil government says, for example, to me, I owe federal taxes and state taxes. I don't have to pay them because I'm a Christian. For so is the will of God that with well-doing, that is, I pay my taxes. You pay your taxes. With well-doing, it is right to pay your taxes. With well-doing, you may put to silence the ignorance of foolish men. This is one way to silence the gainsayers against the church. Well, those members of the Church of Christ think that they're above civil government. And they don't pay their taxes. Oh, yes, we do. Oh, yes, we do. We pay our county taxes. House taxes, however many laundry list worth of taxes there are, what are we supposed to do? Pay them. Whose will is it that we pay them? It is the will of God. For what purpose? That we may put to silence the ignorance, that is the lack of knowledge of foolish men. Look at verse 16. 
as free and not using your liberty. That is, we have been released from the burden of sin. Our names are written in heaven. Our citizenship is in heaven. But we're also citizens of some government here, aren't we? Yes, indeed we are. Look at it as free and not using your liberty. Look at the resentful attitude that could come from this. For a cloak of maliciousness. That could mean this, that perhaps some of our brethren in the first century were struggling. Look, Peter Nero's a pervert. He's weird. You know, just look at how he's living. We don't, surely, we don't have to submit to that, do we? Surely, I mean, I understand God ordained civil government, but he didn't put, surely he didn't want that guy in there. Well, you need to think. Sometimes God gives nations exactly what they want. This election this year is going to show a lot about America. And even from those who are running, shows a lot about us as a society, doesn't it? Unfortunately, it's rather pitiful. It's rather pitiful. We don't have too much to choose from, do we? It's pitiful. What condition do you think our society is in? When that's what we're choosing from, what do you think we are? What do you think by and large this country is? We need to get back to see what the Bible says and pray that God doesn't punish us as our sins deserve. And it will happen, unfortunately. Civil government is ordained of God. Does that not settle it? We cannot use our freedom from the burden of sin to say we don't have any part of civil government. Yes, we do. We're obligated to be light in this dark world. If we're not going to be light, who is? Who's going to be the light to the world? If it's not us, then who is it? Let your light so shine before men that they may see your good works and glorify your Father which is in heaven. We need to be active participants in our governmental activities. And then look at it, it's resolved. As free and not using your liberty for a cloak of maliciousness, but as the servants of God. God makes the rules. We obey them from the heart. What is the rule? Submit yourselves to every ordinance of man for the Lord's sake. That is the rule. Now, number two. We're obligated to support civil government. Look at 1 Peter 2.17. This is a four-point sermon. We're just going to look at the last one. Number one, honor all men. Who's all there? That'd be everybody, wouldn't it? Number two, love the brotherhood. What's the brotherhood there? That would be the church, members of the body of Christ. Number three, fear God. Isn't that, aren't these things obviously true? But look at number four. It says honor the king. Now it says honor all men, but then it says at the last... Honor the king. What does that mean if it's not to support civil government? Does anybody still believe in the plenary verbal inspiration of the Bible? Do you know what that means? That means every word of the text is inspired. I'm fully aware that the New Testament was not written in English. I understand that. It was written in Koine Greek. But if this is a reliable version and it is accurately translated from the original, then that is inspired revelation from God. If honor the king is accurately translated from the Greek, that is an inspired statement. Do you believe that? Then that is the will of God. This is the mind of God revealed to us. Honor the king. Consider the aspect of respect. Now we do not live under a kingship, but we should still show respect to all our civil leaders. If not, why not? What does that teach? I know we don't live under a kingship, but civil government is ordained of God and we're obligated to support our civil leaders. Now I understand that our civil leaders have the responsibility to govern correctly. That's another sermon. But the governed, that's us, have the responsibility to support the civil rulers under which we live. Have you read 1 Timothy 2, 1 and 2? 
I exhort, therefore, that first of all supplications, prayers, intercession, and giving of thanks be made for all men, for kings, and for all, A-L-L, that are in authority, that we may lead a quiet and peaceable life in all godliness and honesty. When's the last time you prayed for your president? When's the last time you prayed for your local magistrates? Think about it. Is that, is that New Testament teaching? Do we think we're faithful Christians? When the text tells us to pray for these people and we won't do it, how can we be considered faithful? Well, I want to show you something here. Let's let Jesus settle the matter. Is it all right if we let Jesus settle the matter? Let's let Jesus settle the matter. Turn with me, if you would, to the book of Mark chapter 12. Jesus settles the matter here. Are we obligated to support civil government? We're going to look at Mark 12, verses 13 through 17. But you can also read about this in Matthew 22, 15 through 22, and in Luke 20, verses 19 through 26. But we're going to be again in Mark 12, beginning in verse 13. Will anyone successfully argue with Jesus Christ? Now, they argued with him. Trust me, they're going to try to argue with him here. But were they successful in what they tried to argue against him about? No, they weren't. Mark 12, beginning in verse 13. And they sent unto him certain of the Pharisees, this is a religious sect of the Jews, and of the Herodians. This seems to be a political group. So they're trying to blend the, the religious and the political. Somehow or another, we're going to get Jesus. If we can't get him religiously, we'll get him politically. We're going to find some way to get this man, right? And they send unto him certain of the Pharisees and of the Herodians to catch him in his words. We're going to get him right here. If everybody else has tried, but now we got him. Watch. And when they were come, they say unto him, Master, we know that thou art true and carest for no man, for thou regardest not the person of men, but teachest the way of God and truth. Is it lawful? Watch. Is it lawful to give tribute to Caesar or not? Oh, but watch verse 15. Shall we give or shall we not give? Now we got him. We got him right here. Here's this righteous man we can't deny. It. Pick the Caesar, whichever one you want to pick. Even in Jesus' time when he walked on this planet as a man, the Caesars were corrupt. They were not salt and light by any stretch of the means. Surely this righteous man, we got him right now. He's not going to say that we have to give money to this corrupt bunch. We got him. And once he says that, we're going to get him and do as we please with him. Watch the wisdom of Jesus. But he, what does the text say? What does the text say? But he knowing their hypocrisy. Hypocrisy said unto them, Why tempt ye me? That is, why are you testing me? What do you think you're going to prove by this? What do you expect to gain from this? Bring me a penny. That is, bring me a coin that I may see it. And they brought it. And he saith unto them, imagine him holding that coin right there in front of him. Whose is this image and superscription? Whose picture is this and whose writing is on it? And they said unto him, Caesar's? Now watch. And Jesus answering said unto them, Render to Caesar the things that are Caesar's. Who can argue with that? Render to Caesar the things that are Caesar's. But now watch how he gets them. And to God the things that are God's. And they marveled at him. Jesus paid his taxes when you look at Matthew 17, 24 through 27. And he just clearly taught that we should do likewise. We're to render unto Caesar the things that are Caesar's. That is human government, civil government, human beings make a law. What are we supposed to do? Obey it. That's the rule. What's the exception? If they try to make wrong right or right wrong. We read that last week in Acts 4 and Acts 5, didn't we? But what is the rule? They make the laws and we obey them. Now, number three, let's have some fun. You want to have some fun? Let's have some fun. Number three, let's give some solutions to important questions. What is the rule? I stress this to make it clear. The rule is to obey 
The exception is to disregard it or disobey it. What is the rule? From everything that we've read, the rule is to obey. Now, question number one. Is it God's will for Christians to obey all non-civil, non-sinful aspects rather, of the ordinances of man? One more time. Is it God's will for Christians to obey all non-sinful aspects of the ordinances of man? And obviously that would be qualified by under the laws under which they live. For example, I don't live in France. I don't know what the civil law is in France. That, As far as that goes, that has no bearing on me. I am a citizen of the United States of America, and specifically of North Carolina. Do I have to obey the non, uh, non-sinful aspects of that civil law? Watch. Yes. How many of them? All of them. If not, what does Romans 13, 1 through 7 teach? If not, what does 1 Peter 2, 13 through 17 teach? I'll be standing at the door if I can get there. If that's not what those texts teach, then what does it teach? Question number two. Can you provide one specific example of how and when... God works through civil law. Watch. Yes, I can. Now, the Bible already made that clear, didn't it? Remember Romans 13, 2? Whosoever, therefore, resisteth the power, resisteth the ordinance of God. And they that resist shall receive to themselves damnation. Go back through that text again. Verse 4. For he is the minister of God. Twice. Down in verse 6. For they are God's ministers. So it is clear God works through civil law. Give me one example. I'm going to give you two. Number one, the military. And number two, local law enforcement. Next time you see a military man, you need to thank him. When you see a local law enforcement man, you need to thank them. Why? Because God providentially protects us through those men and women. They are designed, they are put here. Why? To protect us. To keep us safe. And it is God working through them. Do you remember a man by the name of Cornelius? In Acts chapter 10, he was a centurion. He dealt face to face with an inspired apostle. Where did Peter tell him to quit being a centurion? Where is there any indication in the text of Acts 10 and incidentally Acts 11, 1 through 18 gives you an orderly account of what happened? Where is there any indication that the inspired apostle Peter said you're going to burn in hell for being a centurion? There is none. And in fact, go through the rest of the New Testament and see where any person in civil government was told, you're going to burn in the devil's hell simply because you're a judge, because you're a police officer, because you have something to do with civil government. It's not there. Now, would you? let me ask you a practical question. Would you rather have saints in those positions or would you rather have sinners there? Who would you rather have there? Who would you rather have serving in the military? Would you not rather have saints there or would you rather just turn it over to the sinners? Who would you rather go up and down police in your neighborhood? Saints or sinners? Huh? Think about it. Question number three. When are eligible couples joined in and separated from marriage by God? Now listen to this. Since it is true that God works through civil law, Romans 13, 2. And since it is true that civil law is the minister of God for good, Romans 13, 4. Is marriage good? Marriage is honorable in all and the bed undefiled. Hebrews 13, 4. But whoremongers and adulterers God will judge. It seems to me that marriage is a pretty good thing when you understand what the Bible teaches to be a lawful marriage, don't you? It necessarily follows that when two eligible people are in harmony with Matthew 19, 3 to 9, one eligible man, one eligible woman, then God joins them in harmony with the law in which they live. Meaning what? Let me give you an illustration. Uh, For whatever reason, most people like talking about the, the deep, dark jungles of Africa. I don't even know if there are really are places like that, but let's assume that there are. Let's say that the the civil custom is that you hold hands with a woman and jump over a stick in front of at least three people. When's God going to marry those two people? 
in harmony with what Matthew 19, 3 to 9 teaches and in harmony with the civil law under which they live. That would mean that if I hold hands with April and once we jump over that stick, by the time we're on the other side of that stick, guess what happened? I was on this side of that stick single and when I landed on the other side of that stick, guess what I am? What am I? <laughs> Married. Now, we don't jump over sticks here so as far as I know. I don't recall jumping over a stick. Maybe y'all did. But I didn't jump over a stick. I had to go sign papers and pay fees and let them stab me and take blood out of my arms and then go do whatever they do with it and then tell me that I was okay and then have a ceremony and then had to have somebody pronounce me man and wife and then they had to go sign all those papers to have witnesses that were there. Do you understand? Isn't that, whole, isn't that far easier and better to be able to prove that that's my wife? If everybody in this building were to press me and say, Brock, I believe you're a liar. I don't believe on June 30th, 2001, you married her. I say, hold on, friend. Let me go get the paper. Let me get the paper. Let's see what the paper says. I know. Hey, let's open the scripture. Let's see. Open the scripture. And let's see what the paper says. I can prove that's my wife. Do you understand that? That is the wisdom of God. That is the wisdom of God. And we need to be thankful for that. Don't worry, i got three more questions. Number four. Does the fact that civil government misspends my tax dollars give me the authority to not pay? Why? You see what all the federal government does with our money? You see what all the state of North Carolina does with our money? Surely God doesn't want me to pay that. Well, listen, the answer to that question is no. No. Just because they misspend it, does that give me authority to not pay? No. It's their responsibility to do right with that money, but it's our responsibility to do what? Did Jesus pay his taxes? Yes. Did Jesus not teach that we're to pay our taxes? Yes. Romans 13, 7 permanently cleared up any misconception regarding the Christian and taxes. Render therefore to all their dues. Tribute to whom tribute is due. That is taxes. If the federal government says we owe taxes, what do you owe? You owe taxes. If the state of North Carolina says you owe taxes, what do you owe? You owe taxes. How's that work on your home loan? Hmm? Number five, does government have the authority to regulate biblical morality? For example, does civil government have the right, the authority to say abortion is now legal? Or does civil government have the authority to say polygamy is now legal? That'll be the, watch, I'm not a prophet, neither am I the son of a prophet. But once you open up the door to take it away from one man and one woman, where are you going to stop it? If you can have one man and one man and one woman and one woman, why can't you have one man and two women? You didn't think about that, did you, before you went out there and voted for all these people to allow abortion. They're going to allow polygamy. It may not be in my lifetime. It may not be in my children's lifetime. But if it keeps on, the land in which we live will authorize polygamy. Now the question is, does civil law have the authority to regulate biblical morality? No. No, they do not at all. Acts 5.29 proves that God's law supersedes the laws of men. God is opposed to homosexuality. No matter what council on this planet, no matter if you had all the most powerful human beings in the world with all the authority, and they come up and say that homosexuality is all right, they're wrong. Civil government has no authority to make wrong right. What about abortion? Listen, abortion is murder. Do you not realize that I am opposed to any person who would come to murder you? I'm opposed to that. I'm anti-murder. Is that bad? I am anti-murder. I do not want to see you murdered. Nor do I want to see any human being murdered. And an unborn child in the womb is still a human being. Life begins at conception. To intentionally end that child's life is murder. 
It's murder. You can fancy up, call it abortion. It's murder. That's murder. You cannot have God's authority to murder anyone. So I'm opposed to that. Because the Bible is opposed to that. Last one. I guess here would be the heart of the matter. Is it a sin in the eyes of God if a Christian does not obey all non-sinful aspects of civil law? I guess that's what it really boils down to. I can get up here and talk and do whatever else, but if you don't believe that it's a sin, what do you care? Now, I'm going to turn you to a scripture, 1 John chapter 2. I'm going to remind you of the language of Romans 13.1, let every soul be subject unto the higher powers. Does that read like a suggestion or a command? I'm going to remind you of 1 Peter 2.13, submit yourselves to every ordinance of man for the Lord's sake. Does that sound like a suggestion or a command? Then here's the question. Can you break any of God's commands and still be faithful in His sight? Mm. 1 John chapter 2, verse 3. And hereby we do know that we know Him when, John, if we keep His commandments. Is Romans 13 one a commandment? Is 1 Peter 2, 13 a commandment? Now you think that's talking about baptism. It would include baptism, but is it limited to just the plan of salvation? No. He that saith, verse 4, I know him. And what does the text say? Keepeth not his commandments. Titus 3, 1 and 2. Put them in mind to be subject to principalities and powers, to obey magistrates, to be ready to every good work, to speak evil of no man, to be no brawlers, but gentle, showing all meekness unto all men. Does that sound like a suggestion or a command? He that saith, I know him, and keepeth not his commandments is a liar. And the truth is not in him. If I don't answer your question, I don't know what else I could say. Verse 5. But whoso keepeth his word, in him verily is the love of God perfected. And hereby know we that we are in him. How do I know that I'm in Christ? When I see what the New Testament teaches, and I do what the New Testament teaches. Verse 6, He that saith, he abideth in him, ought himself also so to walk, even as he walked. What did Jesus teach regarding civil government? What did Jesus teach regarding the paying of taxes? If we're going to say that we're Christians, doesn't that mean to be Christ-like? What did Jesus do? Well, you ponder that. Is it a sin? Yes, it's a sin. Obedience to Christ clearly involves more than simply hearing, believing, repenting, confessing Christ, and being baptized. That's true. Because we got to be faithful. We got to be faithful unto death. But you know what's true in anything? There has to be a starting point. There has to be a starting point. You have to be in Christ in order to be a Christian. How do I get in Christ? Hear the truth, Acts 18. Believe the truth. John 8, 24. Repent of sin, Acts 3, 19. Confess Jesus Christ to be the Son of God, Romans 10, 9 and 10. Be immersed in water for the remission of sins. Be buried with Christ, Romans 6, 3 to 5, so that you can be raised up to walk in newness of life. And brethren, we got to be faithful. Revelation 2, 10. Come now, as together we stand, and as we sing the song of encouragement.